So, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to start on time, this, since this is now the Swiss part of uh, the symposium. <laughs> so, we know that uh, uh, the excellent presentations we already had have uh, uh, sparked quite some discussions. Uh, um, but uh, as, a, as an adopted Swiss researcher, I have uh, learned to keep a tight schedule. So, it is my pleasure to introduce first, allow me to introduce myself briefly. My name is Gian Domenico Borazio. I work at the University of Lausanne and I'm one of the four organizers of this symposium. And it is a pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Georg Bosshardt, who is assistant professor at uh, Zurich University Hospital. He is a geriatrician and an ethicist and uh, one of the foremost uh, researcher on assisted suicide in Switzerland. And he will talk about assisted suicide in Switzerland, origins, developments, and empirical findings. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. I'm coming from Zurich a small place compared to Berlin. Unfortunately, no pictures, as Agnes from Rotterdam. A small place in a small country, so Switzerland is really different from Germany, not only in terms of size, and it will be interesting to learn uh, how helpful the Swiss experience will be for the big country, Germany. The legal background of assisted suicide in Switzerland is pretty simple and short. Note that we don't have a law on assisted suicide as they do have in Oregon or a law on euthanasia as they do have in the Netherlands. It's just Article 115 of the Swiss Penal Code stating that any person who for selfish motives assists another person to commit or to attempt to commit suicide will be punished with imprisonment up to five years or with a monetary penalty. Uh, there is another article, 114, stating that killing on request is a criminal act. So you can see that actually the legal regulation in Switzerland is pretty similar to Germany, where assisted suicide is not regulated at all in the penal code, which means that it is not a criminal act in Germany. And also killing on request is uh, prohibited in Germany under, I think, Article 216 of the German Penal Code. So it seems that actually not so much legal, but cultural, historical and sociological factors might be more important for the fact that we deal completely differently with the issue of assisted suicide than you do in Germany. And this is one manifestation of these uh, cultural differences, uh, right to die societies, they have played a crucial role in the development of assisted suicide in Switzerland, and they still do. The most important or the biggest right to die society in Switzerland is Exit Deutsche Schweiz in the German-speaking part of Switzerland, uh, founded in Zurich in 1982, and they started in the late 1980s to openly provide personal assistance through suicide uh, exclusively to Swiss residents. And they found that in Switzerland there are physicians willing to openly prescribe a little dosage of natrium pentobarbital, and they found that there were pharmacists willing uh, to dispense the little drug and most importantly, they found that the authorities were willing to tolerate uh, these acts as unselfish motive, motivated assisted suicide under Article 115. EXIT has about 80,000 members. We have a population of some 6 million in the German-speaking part and about 2 million uh, in the French-speaking part and a quarter of a million in the Italian-speaking part. So this means that more than one in hundred 
uh, Swiss residents are member of a right to die society, which is completely different from Germany, of course. Uh, the preconditions for assisted suicide, the internal preconditions uh, of exit are hopeless prognosis, unbearable symptoms or unacceptable disabilities. There is a French, uh, in the French-speaking part, a sister organization of exit called Exit ADMD, Association pour le droit de mourir dans la dignité, founded in Geneva in 1982. They only provide assistance in suicide since about 2000, also exclusively to Swiss residents, and they today have about 20,000 members, and their preconditions are incurable disease or important disability or intolerable suffering or incapacitating multimorbidity due to old age. Maybe the most, I say, famous organization here in Germany is the organization Dignitas, founded in Zurich for not 1997, it was 1998, I think. Assistance in suicide is provided mainly to non-Swiss residents. Uh, Dignitas has about 7,000 members all over the world, half of them in Germany. And the preconditions for assisted suicide are as follows. Fatal disease or unendurable pain or un unendurable disability. When exit started, with an open practice of personal assistance through suicide, there was something that was in a grey area, uh, namely the role of the doctor. This only became clear by a Zurich Administrative Court ruling in 1999. The court ruled that a physician providing assistance in suicide does not necessarily violate the rules of medical practice given that certain preconditions are met. First, concerning the patient, there must be a personal examination and an open discussion and information. And to the authorities, a doctor providing assisted suicide must uh, provide a medical diagnosis and an indication why assisted suicide was provided to the authorities. And there must be an assessment and a written documentation of decisional capacity. This ruling was later confirmed by the Swiss Federal Court in 2006. And in that ruling, the Swiss Federal Court also gave for the first time a specification on the situation of assisted suicide in individuals asking for it on the basis not of a somatic disease, but of a serious mental disease. And the court said that an incurable permanent serious mental disorder can be the cause of suffering comparable to that of a physical illness. The court said that decisional capacity for assisted suicide in these individuals is not necessarily impaired. And assisted suicide in these cases requires a report by an expert in psychiatry providing evidence that the patient's desire to die is not the expression of a curable psychiatric disorder but a well-considered and permanent decision based on rational judgment. Note that this court decision uh, is much more open than what the Swiss Academy of Medical Sciences says in their medical uh, ethical guidelines. The Swiss Academy has for decades stated uh, that assisted suicide is not part of a physician's task. This is the famous uh, sentence, Beihilfe zum Suizid ist kein Teil der ärztlichen Tätigkeit. But it was not clear what this actually meant. And in the new guidelines released in 2004, the academy provided more specification what is meant by the sentence. And the academy says, a personal decision of conscience by an individual physician to provide assistance in suicide has to be respected. And in this case, the physician has to check the following preconditions. The patient's disease justifies the assumption that the patient is approaching the end of life. So we do not have uh, a six-month rule as in Oregon in the law, but at least in theory we have a kind of that rule in the medical ethical guidelines. Alternative possibilities for providing support have been discussed and, if desired, 
have been implemented. The patient is capable of making the decision. His wish has been thought out without external pressure and he persists in this wish. This has been checked by a third person who is not necessarily a doctor. Note this is a very important sentence because in reality this a third person is the volunteer of the right to die society. This means that actually even in the guidelines of the Swiss Academy of Medical Sciences there is a sort of acceptance of the role of right to die societies. Uh, how does this division of tasks and responsibilities in assisted suicide in Switzerland look? We have listed that in recent paper on this uh, table and we have compared that to the Oregon model. So uh, blue is the Oregon model, red is the Swiss model. Uh, I think the role of right to die societies in the northwest of the United States is often underestimated. Actually I think the compassion and choice is also played a crucial role. Maybe not as crucial as in Switzerland, but right to die societies in the United States, they do matter, they are important. And these are the different steps leading to assisted suicide. And here we can see the different responsibilities of doctors and organizations. If a patient uh, plans to commit assisted suicide, he either can contact first his doctor or he first contacts the organization. This is the same in Oregon and Switzerland. At a certain point in time, there must be an open discussion and information on diagnosis, prognosis and treatment options and this is very clear that only a physician can provide this. There must be an assessment of decisional capacity and uh, a checking that there is no coercion and in the Swiss model there is a responsibility of the doctor but also a responsibility of the organizations. So uh, the authorities, authorities they do really rely not only on the report of the doctor, but also on the report of the right to die society, which does not seem to be the case in Oregon. Prescribing the lethal drug, of course, can only be done by a doctor. Dispensing the lethal drug, that's an often forgotten rule, but there are also pharmacists included in the procedure. And that's a crucial point, providing advice and support during self-administration of lethal drug. So who is present at death? And normally in Switzerland, the doctor is not present, of course, completely different to the Netherlands and to Belgium. But it seems that the situation is similar to Oregon, where basically not the doctor, but a volunteer of the right to die society is present. Reporting to the authorities is different. In Switzerland, all assisted suicides are by the member of the Right to Die Society reported to the authorities and then the deaths are investigated on the spot by the authorities as unnatural death, as suicides. Whereas in Oregon, there is no uh, on-the-spot investigation as far as I know. I think I'm going to skip that. What is the established legal practice? So this is not case law, but it's uh, established in everyday practice. In patients who are unable to swallow, assistance in dying using IV drips is common practice. These cases are classified as assisted suicide rather than active euthanasia as long as the patient himself handles the final act leading to death, namely the opening of the tap of the drip. Charging an appropriate physician's fee to the patient for the preparatory examinations and discussions does not equal a selfish motive. Therefore, this is no violation of Article 115 of the Penal Code. And as to assisted suicide in institutions, as to hospitals, uh, in the German-speaking part, in hospitals, usually assisted suicide is prohibited but it is allowed in some hospitals in the French-speaking part. And in nursing homes, the internal regulations are inconsistent. In some nursing homes, I think even in the majority, it is allowed. Uh, but if it is allowed, health staff of the nursing home is prohibited 
to participate usually. And now the empirical part. These are data, official data of the Swiss Federal Statistical Office. We can see a steady increase of the cases of assisted suicide in Switzerland over the last uh, 10 years. The increase is even more marked over the last few years. And these are the very same data of the Swiss Federal Statistical Office in red, but it's underlaid by the numbers provided by the Right to Die societies on their official web page. And this fits pretty well, you know, uh, Exit Deutsche Schweiz and Exit Romandie, uh, they only provide assistance in suicide to Swiss residents, and the statistics of the Swiss Federal Statistical Office only relates to uh, Swiss residents. So the numbers uh, fit almost completely, and in purple, uh, we have suicide tourism, the cases have increased in 2006, and since then they are more or less stable in incidence. Where are these people coming from? Uh, Germany is the most important country. Almost half of these individuals are traveling from Germany to Switzerland, and one quarter from the UK. Other important countries are France, Italy, United States, Austria, and Canada. This is assisted suicide according to sex. You can see that in the 1990s more men than women committed assisted suicide. Now it has changed. There are clearly more women than men uh, among those individuals asking for and also getting assisted suicide. This slide of the Swiss Federal Statistical Office uh, relates assisted suicide to suicide. I mean, it's questionable how much sense it makes to relate uh, assisted suicide to suicide, to add it on the suicide rate, because I think assisted suicide is, with many respects, different from an ordinary suicide. But anyway, uh, in blue, we see that the suicide rate in Switzerland has steadily uh, decreased over the last 20 years in men and also in women, but more clearly in men. And even if you add assisted suicide, these are the assisted suicides here and here, even if you add them to the suicide rate, the suicide rate has not increased. This is assisted suicide according uh, to age. It's completely different from ordinary suicide. Uh, the peak of ordinary suicides is uh, in the age of around 50, whereas the peak of assisted suicide is in the late 70s. You have seen from the slides uh, by Agnes van der Heide that in the Netherlands you would never do that. You would not correlate a euthanasia to suicides but to natural death, which probably makes more sense and then it would be much closer. The peak of natural death in terms of age is around 85, so the curve were something like that. These are the diseases uh, that have left to the request of assisted suicide in Switzerland. Roughly speaking, we can say that around two in three cases in Switzerland uh, show a fatal diagnosis. Maybe they are not terminally ill, but they do suffer from a medical diagnosis that would inevitably lead to death. Basically cancer, but still cancer is not as predominant among assisted suicide in Switzerland as it is the case in the Netherlands, 80%, or in Oregon also some 80%, as much as I remember. Depression or mental illness it's a rare incidence, but it happens. Less than 5% of all cases, but still it exists. We have also seen the court ruling by the Swiss uh, Federal Court. And we have a sort of one third of cases uh, where the individual asking for assisted suicide was not fatally ill. Uh, we have diagnoses such as musculoskeletal diseases, blindness, diabetes, other, there are a lot of pain syndromes here. And most of these individuals 
uh, are high in age and they are suffering from multimorbidity. So this is close to the Altersfreitod, to the uh, suicide in very old age. This is also on at the percentage of fatal diseases. I uh, said that one third does not suffer from a fatal disease and actually the percentage of non-fatal uh, clients has increased. This is in green. In the early exit days there were, were almost no cases uh, suffering from a non-fatal disease. Today we have one third. Also the proportion of women has increased and the proportion of individuals over 85 years has increased. So the situation is not stable with respect to that situation. And this is probably one of my last slides because I would like to have also a discussion on the issue. Uh, this is uh, a study on the reasons uh, of the individuals asking and committing assisted suicide. And on this column, these are, it's a study on 165 patients in the Institute of Legal Medicine at the Zurich University. And these are the reasons provided by the patients in their reports to the authorities, to the doctors, uh, to the societies. And these are the reasons taken up by the doctors in their reports. And we made uh, three different groups, physical reasons, social reasons, and psycho-existential reasons. Pain or fear of pain was predominant in more than half of all cases. This is much more than in Oregon. I have no explanation for that. And dyspnea was uh, there in around a quarter of all cases. And you can see that this is appropriately taken up by the physicians in their reports. Social reasons are also important. Need of long-term care or the fear of becoming in need of long-term care uh, was in almost uh, half of the cases uh, was important and this also is taken up by the doctors in their reports. And immobility or fear of becoming immobile also was an important social reason. And then there was a third type of reason which is different, which has not a close relationship probably to the medical situation, at least not to a particular medical diagnosis. Uh, control on circumstances of death is very important for the individuals. Although doctors rarely report this in their reports, but almost half of all individuals said, I want to control the circumstances of death. I want to stay at home. I don't want to go to a hospice. I don't want to go to hospital. I want to die where I have spent the last few years. And loss of dignity, even a more a complicated kind of reason. Almost half of the cases the patients mentioned, I have fear of losing my dignity. I don't want uh, to become dependent. For example, in the context of early dementia, I'm afraid of changing my personality. Uh, I don't know, know what memory I will leave to my relative. So very uh, complicated uh, reasons. And you can see that doctors do not take it up in the, the reports. So this is a type of motive that is not or normally not discussed with the doctors. And I think it's even more predominant than in these numbers. I think I'm going to skip that for time reasons. Uh, what, how can the Swiss model be judged? I leave it to you. I just uh, put two quotations here, uh, judging the Swiss model from a completely different perspective. And this might be a good basis for the discussion. Uh, this is what my Norwegian colleague uh, Lars Jorn Matestedt and I wrote in the current edition of the Oxford textbook of palliative medicine. Uh, the Swiss practice is an instructive model in terms of showing what tasks and responsibilities can be dealt with without necessarily having to involve medical professionals. This division of tasks allows a certain distance between clinical practice and assisted suicide 
that may be perceived as helpful by many doctors. And a completely different statement by the US American lawyer uh, Günther Louis, who wrote a book on assisted death in Europe and America, uh, appeared in Oxford University Press a couple of years ago. Uh, he wrote, in Switzerland, the strong commitment to patient autonomy has at times also led to a disregard of safeguards designed to prevent abuse. There prevails a right to die mentality and in some cases there is little indication that alternative options such as palliative care are seriously considered. With that, I thank you very much for your attention and open the discussion. Thank you very much, Dr. Bossert. The floor is open for discussion. Yes. In, in one presentation, um, um, there was mentioned control, wish of control. I question myself whether this is, yes, whether this is the, the correct uh, description of what people say. Uh, in my experience, um, there are many uh, who want, who say, um, I'm old enough, I have had a rich life, um, further living it is not worth for me. I'm very impressed by that uh, in these old people because they uh, can explain it uh, by very many details. So, uh, I question myself, is control the correct word? Uh, what you mention is what we call tiredness of life, is that correct? So these elderly people saying, I'm... Uh, uh, tiredness of life actually is not the same as control of circumstances of death, but these are uh, other types of uh, expressions such as I really want to stay at home, then I can be with my family, I control the dying process. Both uh, reasons are important, but they are not the same. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, one short question, Christoph Ostgreiter from Erlangen again. Uh, could you comment on the trend we see in all these countries. We, we saw it from the Netherlands, we saw it from the Oregon situation, and we see it in the Netherlands that there is an increase in number of patients seeking for uh, euthanasia or assisted dying. Have you any comments on that? Well, I think it's a simple fact that the population wants to have the option of assisted suicide or euthanasia. And once you have it, uh, there is even an increase in demand. Yes. Maya Falkenberg from Hamburg. Um, is there any explanation why um, the number of the women is um, higher in the numbers for normal suicide? I think this is simply uh, an effect of the fact that the individuals today are more, uh, older than they were uh, 20 years ago. And in individuals uh, 85 or older, you have more women. I think it's rather that. Okay, yeah. So, we have one last question. But I would like to ask uh, a short question. EXIT is now advocating for enlarging the spectrum of uh, um, assisted suicide to um, basically frail elderly. Uh, what would be your position as a researcher in, in view of your data? What would be your prediction? What would that change in the practice in Switzerland? You mean in my personal life as a doctor, what it would change? What, 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 your prediction, what it would change for the societal practice, uh, uh, given your data that you have collected so far, what well, would change? Actually, although there is a, an increase, the, uh, the number of cases is very rare. It's, it's much rarer than in the Netherlands. And I have worked as a nursing home physician for many years. 
in all those years, I came across two or four cases where I was seriously asked for assisted suicide, but all these individuals in the end died naturally. So it's not as common as you could believe just looking at the data. Uh, it seems to be more uh, common for GPs because normally it happens in privacy, not in nursing homes. I don't, actually, I don't know where we are going to, what is a matter of fact that once exit uh, announced to open the practice to, to Alters Freito, to these elderly people, there was a huge increase in membership again. So it seems that the population really wants to have the option available. But I don't know what uh, will be the effect within five, ten years, and we must really be careful on it. Thank you very much again, Dr. Bossard.